Hello and welcome to the Extremist Publishing Podcast. I'm Tom Christie, and it's a great pleasure to be joined today by Mr James R. A. Herriot, who's going to tell us all about his new book, The Sabbatical. Now, The Sabbatical is a travel book quite unlike any other. It has a unique quality, which James is going to tell us about today, and I'm delighted to speak with him about the project and the inspiration for the book to come about. So, James, thank you very much for agreeing to talk with us today. Thank you, Tom. The sabbatical takes a very unusual look at the world, and it certainly is world travel because it seems that you've you've covered just about every area of the globe, places that are local and places that are far flung. How did the project come about? The project came about really due to um, to lockdown and our inability to travel, our inability to meet our children and our grandchildren and our friends. And it was an idea I'd been mucking about with for a while, but it was the second COVID-19 lockdown that really drove the project in that I decided I should put pen to paper or I should say finger to keyboard and put the whole project together and it it was really to it was a story for our children and friends it was um it it, it was a very vicarious way of traveling we we visited or revisited uh 52 places around the globe some far afield some close to home um, over the year and we did one a week and we we took six pictures of every one of these places and we put it all together it was very much it was more than just the places it was trying to demonstrate the experiences and the people we met and how lucky we'd been in life over many many years and I suppose with our children there was a message we we wanted to impart you know the world the world's your oyster do with it what you can with an open and inquiring mind and we've been very very lucky to meet such a broad range of people um, and see places um, they vary from very local my hometown of Berwick upon Tweed which I I adore it, it um, it's a gem at the Scottish Highlands we've been very lucky to go there so many times over the years but so lots of local things but also we've been lucky enough to travel in Australia and we've we've been round the outback we've been to the rainforest we've been to the islands um, we've been to New Zealand we've we've had some fairly amazing experiences um new york um some of them are rather deeper new york we went shortly after 9 11 and we we saw the the devastation that was caused and we went back a few years later when my son and daughter-in-law were working there and we went to the the 9 11 um memorial museum um so it's it's a very very broad picture and over and above that it relates not just to people and um it relates to books that we we've picked up around the world in different bookshops and tell a story and resonated with us it was also 52 pieces of classical music and each one of those in a way tells its own story and relates to the um, it relates to the places the experiences the friendship the the knowledge that we we've, we've gained we also have 52 pieces of contemporary music which are things that Debbie my wife and I they they bring back memories they mean something to us um one of the most important ones at the end it's also 52 fine wines that uh, we happen to have consumed with friends and family throughout the world in different locations but again means so much to us 
Well, the pandemic lockdown was, I'm sure for everyone, a, a difficult period to get through the travel restrictions, meaning that no one was able to go beyond, say, five miles around their home. So I think one thing that will jump out to many people will be the wonderful illustrated um, stories that you tell and the many different very colourful photographs uh, that accompany these tales. I'm most likely dyslectic. I, I, I see things through imagery and I remember things through imagery. So all the pictures we, we looked out, it, it's six images of every place and I love to take a picture that tells a story. And I'd, I'd like to think when people see the sabbatical, each one, it, it has special pictures. I think there's a number that stand out to me. My, my father fought at Monte Cassino in Italy during the last war, um, on very much on the front line there. And, and I went to visit it and I, I have a picture of a, a cross, but it's actually made up, it, it's for the Poles who eventually took the monastery. Um, I should add something like there were 55,000 allied casualties during this battle, which just gives you some kind of idea. But it, this was a, a, a destroyed tank, but they'd used the um, tracks from the tank to create a crucifix. And there's just lots of images, one of Thailand where um, pure fluke I, I there were two ladies local ladies digging for clams on the beach and there we were staying in the lap of luxury um, and also behind was somebody on a windsurfer and I by pure fluke I managed to get those um, the two ladies and the windsurfer and it, it just showed you know abject poverty against wealth and so lots of the stories, you know, New York um, showing the 9-11, um, you know, museum and things like that. Um, skiing in Italy, skiing in France, going to the Highlands, which we love, um, you know, the Northumbrian coast, which we, Bambra Castle, Holy Island, just each one was trying to find images that really demonstrate the story that we were trying to tell and impart. Hopefully that Tom helps you a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, because one of the things that certainly jumped out at me when I was reading the book was that incredible juxtaposition from places that many of us will find familiar to places that perhaps will be less familiar to readers. Um, you mentioned New York, which it might not be the capital of the USA, but it's been called the capital of the world because of its sheer cultural relevance. But then you mentioned places like Lindisfarne and Chillingham Castle, and most especially Berwick-on-Tweed. Um, now, having lived there, it's a wonderful, wonderful place, and I would certainly recommend anyone who hasn't been there uh, to visit it. And if you have been there, I would recommend you come back and visit it again because there's always something new to find out in Berwick. Um, now, Berwick has been called not the Venice of the North, but the Venice of the Far North, um, and only Jerusalem has changed hands more <laughs> regularly. Um, so what was it about the local area that, uh, that attracted you to, to write um, about it in the book? Well, I, I was actually born in Berwick, um, in Castle Hills, which at that time was the maternity um, hospital. So I go back an awful long way. We actually were brought up in a little village five miles up the river. I'm lucky enough, I, I went away and worked in London. I've worked in different places around this country, but we've been back in the borders since our, our daughter was born. I, I adore Berwick. I have um, a real affinity to the place. Um, for my sins, I was actually on the Berwick upon Tweed Preservation Trust for 16 years. I was chairman for eight. So I've watched the change over my life. People, um, people don't understand just how desperate things were in Berwick in the 50s and 60s and 
I, I look back at the people who started the Preservation Trust. Funnily enough, it's 50 years old this year. But at the time it was formed, Berwick was reputed to have um, the largest number of buildings, listed buildings at risk in the whole of certainly um, England, if not the whole of the UK. And I look back at the work that they've done. And if you, Berwick's a very special place. If you wander around, because it's a walled town, it's, it's got the only set of um, Elizabethan bastion walls in the whole of the UK. You know, there's only a, a handful around the whole world. It's very special. You can walk around the walls and, and see a very special place. And as I say, I, I watch it change. I, the work that the local builders local residents restoring buildings I've I've watched it over many many years and it it just gets better and better um, it is a special place it, 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 it means an awful lot to me and I've traveled been lucky enough to travel to an incredibly varied number of places and see different things but we love to come home and uh, we love to show our friends from around the world uh, Berwick and uh, most people are blown away when they see it I'm not sure I should be telling you that because I quite like it being quiet but uh, does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, it certainly does because uh, prior to Edward I and his ill-fated visit to Berwick it was in fact the largest town in Scotland um, so it, it's amazing to see it now and consider what it would have been like in its heyday um, because interestingly of course anyone coming to North Northumberland I think will be impressed by that amazing collision of the, the very modern um, and the inescapably ancient and I think that is an element that you've captured in your book uh, when you talk about some of the amazing landmarks that are here in the area that are just waiting for people to come and visit them. Yeah again having been brought up here gone away come back um, it was actually great fun to remember events and places um, you mentioned Chillingham Castle and I mention it in the book that one of the most amazing events we ever went to and, and this is 30 odd years ago and it was um, for a charity event and it was brilliant we started where I'm sitting now in in our house we had a um, we had friends for for drinks had champagne got on the bus went to Chillingham there was a full pipe band playing in the the courtyard they had um, they had a massive marquee. They had Laser Quest in the dungeons. They had a um, full blown casino going. They actually had dodgem cars in the woods and all sorts. And I look back at that event, and we we went there in daylight. We left in daylight, um, and I look back. Oh, to be young again. I'm not sure I could quite cope today, but. Uh, but yes, it's so many places. Um, I mentioned other local places, Cragside, you know, Lord Armstrong for me. If, if people look back at Lord Armstrong, he was a man. Well, he and his wife were just so far ahead of the world with regard to conservation and environmental things. Um, you look at what Cragside is. Marchmont House. Um, over on the Scottish side you know I look at what Hugo Burge is doing there at this moment and you watch the restoration of the house and and what goes on but you know we, we mentioned I think uh, you know the Northumbrian coast Holy Island, Bamburgh um, going up the coast, Eyemouth, St Abbs Coldium, you know there's just so much in our part of the world um, and it was just full of memories. And of course, going to the opposite extreme, um, beyond the uh, the local sites and the many, many things that there are to see in North Northumberland, um, you actually go to the other side of the planet, into Australia and New Zealand. Uh, that must have been quite a contrast. 
total contrast and it was also an education um my my aunt and uncle um and my three cousins went to australia as 10 pound poms in the 60s and um it's it, sadly my cousin who who married a great great friend um penny and um he, he died many years ago, but we picked up our relationship, you know, a couple of decades ago. And, and it's really through, through all our Aussie mates that we, we've learned so much, you know, the whole um, Aboriginal thing, you know, I wasn't taught anything of these things. And um, we've been lucky enough to go round the outback, go to the rainforest, um, see different things but I've read I've read a lot of books um, a favorite bookshop of mine is in Albert Park in Melbourne and I used to go in and ask well what should I read to learn about Australia it's something I actually do when we go around the world is I often go into a bookshop and say what should I read you know to learn and I've got a very different viewpoint you, you know it's been a an amazing experience um i meet lots of australians and i you know they say have you ever been and i explain some of the places and they go god you, you've seen more of australia than i have and and we've had some amazing experiences um landing on a on a little private plane in birdsville in the middle of um the the desert and um, playing pool with the locals. Um, th there are lots and lots of memorable stories. Um, New Zealand would be the same. We great, great friends um, took us on a whistle stop tour and um, Didi's actually a, a, a Kiwi. So we just went from one party to another to another. But places like Stewart Island, which you know the the last inhabited island before antarctica it's it's fascinating to see a tiny population um going up the waimak in jet boats and whatever with a bunch of mad kiwis we there's lots and lots of stories that um and um, it is learning it, it it's been a the sabbatical was an education for us and, and, and going back over time and what we've learned and trying to pass some of that on to our children and grandchildren and hopefully encourage them one day maybe to visit some of these places. Yes, because on the subject of learning new things, you even had a, an outback trek with your very own Crocodile Dundee style tour guide. That must have been quite an experience. It was. That was Shane. We were in the Daintree rainforest up on... Um, Cape Tribulation, Weary Bay, where Captain Cook and his boat um, ran aground. Um, again, an amazing trip, just in the middle of nowhere. It was just Debbie and I, and um, Shane. Shane was a interesting character, walking around um, the woods in his, well, the forest in his um, bare feet, and we. I actually show a picture of him with a snake, but we're also eating bush tucker and uh, funny enough it, it, it's worth trying some of these things a witchery grub taken straight out of a tree and alive um, I I was the only one willing to try it and I have to say they tasted it all right but no one else would have a go but uh, we also saw the crocodiles it, it, it was just an amazing experience and and you learn so much from these people well, not wishing to put you on the spot, but with 52 really unforgettable experiences, do you have any one favourite that you particularly treasure? Oh, I think that's an impossible one. They're, they're so different. Um, I start the sabbatical with one of my favourite places in the world, and um, lockdown should have been my 30th anniversary of fishing the Laxford at the top of Scotland and again the education really comes from the people I got to know over the years you, you know 
the gillies and the stalkers, the people who live there. Um, it's an education, there you are running a business um, and chasing God knows what. And these people do something that they love and their knowledge and everything else. Um, so the Laxford and the Highlands would be very much up there, but, but yeah, experiences sailing in Croatia, um, sailing in Turkey, um, Italy, just honestly taking up skiing at 60, um, which is a pretty mad thing to do. And I've broken the odd thing, but you know, again, just different experiences. I, I couldn't, I couldn't pick out a favourite. I think it would be it would be the wrong thing to do. And finally, it would be remiss of me not to ask, given that you've been to so many different places, and really, it wouldn't be you know stretching it to say all around the world. Whatever are you going to do with all those air miles? Not sure I should talk about that in the current <laughs> environmental thing. And that the great thing about the sabbatical is all all I did was sit in my office. I didn't couldn't drive anywhere couldn't fly anywhere or sail anywhere or or, or whatever um, so um, I'm sure we're not finished I'm sure there's well we already have some new ones planned but um, we have to catch up with our friends in Australia we we missed two very important 70th birthdays during um, lockdown and the sabbatical in a way was a started out as a massive thank you for um, our Aussie sabbatical friends and um, that's one place we need to get back to really to to finish off you know some of the things that were started and a big one to say thank you. Well James thank you very much for having taken the time to join us today and to talk about your book Certainly, I, I can't begin to see how many things I learned about world travel from having having read it and uh, certainly felt immersed with all of the, the different visual guides that you gave to the many different places that you've, you've visited over the years. So thank you very much for sharing that with us and for talking a little bit about the experiences that you've had. It's been a great pleasure, Tom. Thank you. Sabbatical is available to buy from all good online retailers and independent booksellers worldwide. Thank you very much for having joined us today. I hope that you'll tune in again soon. If you would like to find out more about advertising on the Extremist Publishing Podcast, please visit their website at www.extremistpublishing.com for details.